Hello and welcome to the Sociology Show podcast. Do you want to start by telling us who you are and what you do, please? Hello, so my name is Dr Poppy Gibson and I'm a senior lecturer at Anglia Ruskin University in Essex, where I'm currently course lead for three degrees, so pretty busy. Uh, and when I'm not teaching, I just love researching anything around mental health and wellbeing. Busy. Uh-huh. Aren't we all? <laughs> yeah. And um, before you went into that, you worked in primary schools, is that right? Yeah, that's right. Yeah. So I always knew I wanted to be a teacher. So as soon as I went to uni, I trained to be a teacher. And then I was a primary school teacher for just over 11 years. And I kind of taught in and around London. I worked in private schools, mainstream schools, boys schools, girls schools. So I kind of did quite a lot in that 11 years, moved around. But, you know, I think change is also sometimes good. And you get a chance to see different microcosms of behaviour. And that's quite exciting, different ways schools run. So it just so happened towards the end of that, that I became interested in research. So I was doing my PhD while I was a teacher and I just found myself thinking, wow, actually, although I still love teaching, I think research is the way that I want to go. Uh, so I finished my PhD and applied for a lectureship at university. And then I guess the rest is history. So now, now it's a really nice balance. So um, I'm lecturing usually around two or three days a week and then those other days are kind of dedicated to research. It's quite a change going from the little ones to the big ones eh? Yeah well <laughs> you would think so Matthew but uh, definitely some transferable skills that yeah. we, we're still using even with adults. <laughs> I think adults are worse behaved sometimes to be honest. <laughs> <laughs> I couldn't comment our students are fantastic. <laughs> <laughs> um, you, you mentioned me mental health so I'm, I'm always interested what what led people into the their path of interest if you like so um, do you mind telling us a little bit about why that area in particular? Yeah, definitely. So, well, I mean, it's really current to talk about at the moment because I'm sure you and your listeners are all aware about the strikes we've got happening across the country. Um, well, for past months and still continuing for future months. So we've got lots of teachers um, going on strike. And I think even when I was a teacher, although I've been lecturing for six years now, so it's been six years since I was in the primary classroom. But even then, I was really conscious of um, funding being taken out of key services, you know, like mental health services. Um, but our awareness to use these services and to seek support um, becoming more frequent. So I, I was even at the time really conscious that although teaching was the thing written on my contract, what a lot of my time was doing outside of the classroom was pastoral support for the children in my class, uh, meeting parents, meeting carers who they themselves um, were struggling with mental health or supporting them with their child's assessment for a special need or coming to terms with a diagnosis for those parents that found it difficult to understand that their child had been diagnosed with a certain condition. So even when I was a primary school teacher, I was really conscious that when we are educators we're not just teachers it's something bigger than that and then kind of as I've moved into lecturing now like I'm still really confused why mental health isn't the core subject why mental health and physical health aren't the core subjects that we're teaching even in primary school because surely without good mental health how can we do anything mm. um so I'm really interested now, that although I love teaching and I, I lecture on primary education degrees and, and kind of training the next generation of teachers, although we talk about the subject content, what I, I want them to have in their heart is that a lot of funding for these services for our young people and for our families is sadly, you know, becoming less, but the need is becoming more. So actually we need to be smarter in how we support others with our mental health, how we also protect our own mental health as well mm. in a very busy um you know kind of atmosphere that we're in at the moment so I'm just really interested how we can learn more about our behaviors about ourselves both to to grow ourselves and strengthen ourselves but also to support those around us too yeah my, my partner is um she's a counselor in schools in secondary schools actually um and wow. an art therapist and I, th I think the waiting the average waiting list is about 18 months uh, wow for, for someone to come and come and see her uh and, and when you think these are young people, that's a big part of their life to yeah, wait. Something. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Especially if you think for, for a large number, it might be going into their GCSE years. So by the time they can get seen it, they're done. They've finished. So, yeah, it's a, it's a huge issue. Yeah, that's really sad to hear that statistic. 
And, and one of the things that in your research in particular, you focused on sort of young girls experience of, of social media and how that affects mental health, didn't you? Do you want to tell us a little bit more about that? Yeah, of course. So glad to know you've read my uh, PhD thesis. Of course, of course. <laughs> every word. <laughs> <laughs> it is uh, freely available online through Ethos Database, um, as all theses are. But um, yeah, so at the time, like just to give a bit of context for my PhD at the time, and I finished it a few years ago now, but kind of I'm, I'm still very interested in that area, is I was um, a class teacher in a girls' school at the time. And I was really conscious that you know, being a, a young girl in primary school is, is tough enough anyway, and kind of pre-pubescent, managing friendship, uh, you know, the amount of my time as a, a teacher, like for any teachers listening, was, oh, she's not my friend anymore, fights in the playground. So this was going on. And then I was really conscious of, wait a minute, social media, which was coming on their radar as like, you know, eight years old plus, is giving them other platforms to fight, argue, fall out. So it was suddenly like, okay, we don't just need to mitigate this in the classroom now. The, the, these young children are going to find ways that they can communicate away from, you know, a teacher's watchful eye. Um, so what I ended up doing my PhD on was uh, young girls using social media, particularly young girls, because at that time I was really conscious that the number of, I mean, reported cases, we must bear in mind that not everything is reported for everyone, but the number of um, children that were self-harming was um, greatest in girls. The number of children with um, eating disorders, even an anorexia, um, you know, in primary schools was scarily high. So I was seeing, wow, children in the primary school now are dealing with mental health and anxiety. And is social media part of this? So that was kind of the question I wanted to explore. And what I ended up looking at was, are these young girls using social media? And the answer for all of them was yes, even though they're between eight and 11. So you might say, wait a minute, you know, you've got to be 13 to use wh whatever platform, but I'm sure we all know there may or may not have been times that you've tweaked your age to, to yeah. do something that, you know, you shouldn't be doing. Um, and a lot of it came down to that FOMO, that fear of missing out and knowing if their friend was on a particular social media platform that they didn't want to be the one person you know I'm sure you remember even at school you know everyone had a certain type of backpack or a certain pencil case or a certain smelly gel pen and and that was easy enough for you to then beg your parent or carer to hopefully buy it for you but now it was actually how do we keep up with our peers it's about having the same social media platforms um yeah so that was what I studied that is really scary I thought you were going to say ages around sort of teenage I thought you were going to say 13 14 mm -hmm. 15 when we know there's a, a real peak in media uh, social media usage but that that's so so young um I'm not sure if you've been watching the Emily Atak documentary this this week um oh no I have to watch it. It, it it's really it's really good because she's talking about social media and um how it's impacted her and the types of messages she gets sent particularly from men um but she she mentioned in that herself that um age 10 or 11 was really key because as a young woman she was changing I think she went through puberty quite early and she developed boobs quite early and started periods early and you've got all of these changes going on hormonally in life yeah. and to add the social media element on on top of that I mean it's huge it's absolutely huge really huge and and on top of that on top of everything that you say you know was in in Emily's show about her changing then you're suddenly in a world where you know with a simple filter you can change how you look or, you know, a, a fake avatar. So actually, not only now are you worried about how you're presenting in the real life world uh, or the offline world, but now you're having to worry about how you present on the online world. And, you know, even now, I know some people change their likes. So you just see it's liked by by others. Yeah. But there are still many people who are, you know, chasing numbers, chasing followers, seeing how many people like their thing. And, you know, for anyone who uses social media amongst us, even as adults, like you post something and there are those few minutes like, oh my gosh, will anyone like it? You're like, why does it matter? It really, it really doesn't. But, you know, we as humans, as you know so well, we're, we're conditioned to be social, whether we believe that or not. And so wanting someone's appreciation, even appreciation of strangers mm. was such a driver for these children. And actually um, some of the girls who were using a certain um, very like photo platform were um, 
actually being approached in their DMs by strangers uh, asking for nudes. And these were eight year old girls. And so I was saying to them in their interviews, you know, why why are you putting yourself on that platform where you're having these, you know, toxic interactions from people? And again, it just came back to that fear of missing out. They'd rather be on a platform where, as it sounds like in that show, um, yeah. the presenter was finding, you know, not nice, not invited. I mean, totally uninvited uh, messages from men. I hate to say that. Sorry, yeah. men. No, no. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. And, really scary. Was that the biggest concern for, for the girls that um, the, the photos appearance based? Was, was that the main sort of um, issues that the girls were concerned with? Um, really, really interesting because there were lots of things they were concerned with, um, mostly how many responses and likes they were getting to things they were putting out there. So, yeah. you know, whereas if you say something in the real world, you can't really tell who likes it or not. A lot of people might nod, but to actually have a number of hearts next to the thing they put out and be able to see how many hearts someone else got, see how many friends or followers someone's got compared to how many you've got. Um, yeah, like bringing in that competition, like that social competition that I don't think personally is healthy. You know, we we feel it anyway, as we felt it's true, you know, being picked on a sports team, I still have flashbacks to, you know, your PE teacher making you line up and two captains picking, and you're like, oh, I don't want to be last. And you know, I mean, I often was, <laughs> but now to actually be able to have this as a thing you can keep looking back on as well that's the thing about social media isn't it you can keep looking back on it you can reflect on it it's not just that immediate you get picked for a team sports lesson is over it's done it's that constant that constantness of it mm. and um yeah we really, really sad but equally and here's why actually i'm a big advocate for social media um the connections it gave some of those girls particularly I had one participant who was an only child um had an au pair nearly all of the time because her parents were both working one parent working away abroad um and actually it gave her a friendship and a companionship that was so vital mm. so I also think often when we talk of social media we think of all the negatives don't we but for her and I would say even for me as an adult I think the network it can bring into your life and the people it can bring into your life is is actually so empowering and and so for for equally every bad story i had of a man asking for news yeah there were these experiences of someone i mean one girl she was 9 had the ambition of setting up her own online clothing brand a global brand wow. and it was like wow like if we didn't have social media and you hadn't seen influencers and and global shopping, you wouldn't have this big dream. And I don't know, I wish I could find out if she realized it or not. I'm probably buying her clothes <laughs> right <laughs> well, now. Both. I don't even know. But yeah, so that so equally, I I think a lot of people, particularly in the primary school, see the negatives. And you know, we're using an outdated curriculum in primary yeah. schools. We're using a curriculum from 2014 which is crazy, that's coming up to 10 years old, which talks about computing and has such a sketchy skeleton <laughs> of, of rules. And that's why we need such a boost. But you know, what do we hear about in schools? E-safety day. And I think it's so, to me, feels so outdated. Yeah. E-safety day, it's just like, so I've got three children myself, Matthew, and uh, one of my sons came home the other day, he's in primary school, and he said, oh, we had an e-safety day or, or something. And it's a brilliant school, don't get me wrong. So what did you learn? And obviously he's on he's on Roblox gaming all the time. He plays Minecraft online. He's used to, we've had these sensible conversations, how you can enjoy um, online platforms. And he said, oh, we were told, don't give your password to strangers. Don't tell anyone your full name. And I was like, is that still where we're at? Like, no, let's teach kids better. Like they've been using it for years. <laughs> so that was, yeah, equally, I think we need to be doing better in schools because young people are more savvy than us these days how to use these things. I was going to say, I think the, the reality is, the, the, the problem is that we are, as teachers, trying to teach pupils who know more than us. So, you know, mm -hmm. it's, uh, there is an issue there. Um, sorry to reverse it back to the, the negatives, but um, <laughs> okay. I, I was just thinking in, to, do with, uh, to do with mental health. You, were, you already mentioned things like eating disorders, anorexia and so on. Um, what were the other sort of main impacts of social media that you identified on young girls in particular? Yeah, so you can again, add some, you can add some positives as well. Actually, that doesn't all have to be negative. <laughs> um, so again, I think just that that feeling of being judged that was definitely the main negative was the feeling of being judged. You've got to think what you're wearing, even what your background is, and we can tell that we as adults think that because I know in COVID when we were all doing online meetings, I saw a lot of people with the blurry background 
And I was like, what don't you want us to see? Like, what are you hiding? I don't care what's in your background. You know, fair enough if you've got people going back and forth. Yeah. But, you know, clearly as adults, we care. Like, you can see my my messy office behind me. Like, why does that matter? People that put a certain wallpaper on their Zoom meeting. So even as adults, like, clearly that matters. Like, we're presenting a self that we want people to like and we want it to have a certain reputation. So I think that's what was scary for me. Girls between eight and 11, not just thinking about being them, but thinking, how do I present a me that I want to put into the world? And and I just felt like you shouldn't be planning yourself. Like you should just be you. Mm. Um, so that, so, you know, they're having to think what to wear in their photos, where to stage the selfie, um, what face, you know, we've seen all the phases on social media, you know, do you put your fingers in front of your face, <laughs> whatever, do you put certain emojis and stickers on it, do you have to do it as a boomerang, like, so it's not even like what you're putting out there, it's how you're putting it out there, yeah. are you doing it right, are you adding the right soundtrack, uh, and and that, when I did my PhD, it was at the initial stages of that, and I've only seen that get worse, and, but very, some very interesting stuff around mimicking, so, and we we all do that, I'm sure, you know, in meetings. I I know some very good mimics around me. I notice if I'm sitting like this, I notice them copy. Um, people that copy are like verbal sounds or, or behaviours or positions. And I was noticing that really interestingly in the discourse that was being used. So part of my PhD was I set up a blog, a secure blog, just for the purpose of my PhD. So only the girls who had parental consent and who had opted in could log in. They had special login details. And really super interesting on, on that, because um, I, I wanted to look at the blogosphere as like a separate thing, was how some of them mimicked each other, mm. mimic the emojis. Like if someone did a certain emoji, someone else doing that. If someone said, LOL, you know, all those little cheesy things we use, someone else did it. And like, so that was really interesting. Because I think we do sometimes we do that physically without noticing it, but actually seeing then these girls thinking, oh, how do I communicate in these spaces as well? And wanting to, um, yeah, and, and I see it now even as adults when I go on, for example, Facebook and seeing how we might say the same thing on someone's post. But also now a lot of social media does that for us. Like you go on Facebook or Instagram and it's kind of pre-typed your your yeah. response for you. And you're like, do I do I just select this one or do I type my own thing? And very interesting seeing how they communicated not only what they said but where they obviously wanted to try and fit in um through the way they communicated as well i um had a group of students i was getting them to make some little videos which were going to go onto youtube and they started and they went hi what's up guys and i went don't do that everyone does that <laughs> and they sat for ages and they were like we don't know what to start. We were, they couldn't think of another starter because it was such commonality practice you know that's what people wow. do when you start a youtube video hey guys what's up they, they just couldn't think of another starter so yeah that that whole language of mimicking is really interesting isn't it so interesting keep going poppy tell us what else what so the girls were concerned about appearance and um, how they presented themselves the status mm -hmm. that came with with that what else oh i mean i don't give too many spoilers you have to read it <laughs> yeah. um yeah so so the the positive the most positive was the connection yeah so seeing and actually more than that so I'm sure obviously you're aware of um, communities of practice. So in a way, I was seeing the communities of practice come out and um, communities of practice. I'm sure, you know, Lave and Wenger talking about where people with a, a, a same interest or common interest or common passion can get together in a space. And you might have the novices who are just learning something. You might have the experts who know something very well. And they come together and shared passion. And, and that was something I saw on social media. Obviously, some of these girls who'd been using social media for years, you know, they're veterans. <laughs> and then some of these young girls who'd obviously just got their first phone or their first device and were joining for the first time. And um, very sweet to see those. Uh, so this is something I could really see on the blog platform that, that I'd created for this um, research was when some didn't know how to do something. So for example the the veterans the experts in the community of practice had changed their avatar like they'd logged in for the first time so i could see on the back end like who had logged in when and um, and within minutes like their avatar was changed they now had a, a different profile picture i'm like i haven't even told you how to do that like cool you've you've done that yeah. and then there were there were those novices in the group that would type 
how did you get a unicorn as your avatar or or you know they don't even know the word avatar yet and they're saying how did you get your picture as a unicorn and then someone goes to change your avatar do this and then like okay I've picked up that word and then later on you'll see them someone else is struggling and they're like oh to change your avatar do this and really cool like we can use these as really good learning spaces as well and seeing the girls wanting to help each other and the blogs were anonymous so they didn't know who was who um and so also that's what I think was was really great like we don't always have to know who someone is to help each other out and sometimes we can be more cautious of that in the real world um because you can judge someone's age who they are if you want to be associated with them but that was kind of stripped away in, in a really cool way and actually oh we're all just here on this blog that has been set up for this weird research study we've opted into um but okay like let's just get on with it and let's communicate and what I would do um I was setting little daily tasks in there so um um yeah with some really nice really nice stuff going on too so the collaborative element I would think that you know whatever your interest no matter how niche it is there, there'll be someone out there there'll be a forum for it won't there so <laughs> yeah hopefully not on the dark web but yeah well, hopefully true. <laughs> true I have no idea how to access that you'll have to give me some top tips of- <laughs> I'll send you the password after the yeah. show. <laughs> um, sorry, sorry to keep on bringing it back to the negative side again, but one one of the things that we're talking about, uh, my, some of my students are studying media at the moment, uh, topic of media, is that the addiction issue. Um, and a lot mm-hmm. is being said that we don't we don't actually know the long term effects of having the ubiquity of me- media that we've got at the moment. You know, uh, I think the average time for I read the other day, the average screen time for a teenager at the moment is around six to seven hours a day on their phone. Um, which by all, by any measure would be an addiction um, and that's not just to blame teenagers of course I think adults are just as guilty and um, mm-hmm. what, what is early evidence showing us about what this could be doing to us long term yeah really good question so I guess there's so many pockets of research we can look at but I would say the main thing is is what is happening in the screen time so you know, it could be six, seven hours, fine. But what is that time being used for? And um, so another research study that I'm currently doing that you might be interested in, Matthew, is around pornography um, with a colleague who is do- was doing a study um, initially, but this was how he got on my radar, into whether when we as adults switch to home working because of the pandemic, uh, were we more inclined to watch pornography uh, because we were working on laptops all the time? So he was doing that and I I saw him on social media actually <laughs> and I just reached out I was like ooh interesting I'm working in a university with adult learners and I'm interested I wonder if there's a parallel that when we've encouraged them to now move to home study home learning and they're on device all the time are we seeing uh, more consumption of por- pornography more addictive behaviors um so that's something we we're, we're just working on at the moment so watch this space for that one but again so I think that screen time can can be really good. Like if you were that only child that was in my PhD uh, thesis, where for you that six or seven hours is you having social communication, having a really nice WhatsApp thread with someone that's really wholesome. Um, you know, some of us, like you say, we're probably on more than six and seven hours. I don't mm-hmm. know, <laughs> but but what is it you're doing in, in that time that is making the difference? So if it's if it's those positive spaces, it can be really purposeful. And good for you and good for your well-being um even me as an adult like I love Twitter I don't know if I'm allowed to say that I love social media <laughs> and uh I was actually put into Twitter jail over the new year um apparently due to some suspicious activity on my account okay. uh and I, I just couldn't like tweet dm I could read dms but not reply to any my followers went to zero so I couldn't communicate with anyone and it made me also realize how we often only have friends in a certain space. There were some of those people that I had, you know, on LinkedIn and whatever. I wasn't going to message them and say, I'm in, I'm in jail. Um, and so for me, I definitely had, like, it was definitely cold turkey for me. Like, there was some withdrawal going on. I'm someone who's quite like an avid uh, poster. And it was, it was very strange for me suddenly having that taken away and made me think, wow, I am addicted to this. Hmm. But but in a good way, like I, I love this and it makes me feel good about myself. And I feel like I'm sharing positive messages with people. Um, and I felt really miserable. Like I think people could see I was under some cloud for three days and it felt really pathetic that it was just because I couldn't communicate on a social media platform. Like I'm an adult. I have friends around me. I have family around me. I had work. 
um but really strange and I and I think we can reflect on that addiction as well I did take a social media break probably about seven years ago I quit social media for a year um because it got to the point where everything I ordered to eat and everywhere that I went I went there or I ordered it because I knew it would be cool on social media so I was ordering the food that I knew would look good like you know maybe I just wanted the soup but I'm gonna order the like snazzy burger because it's gonna look good or maybe I wanted to stay in my pajamas but I'm gonna take my kids to Legoland because I can do a cool picture and um and it got to that point and I was like I mean benefits again I mean I was doing cool stuff because I wanted to show this lifestyle but equally then thinking i I shouldn't be powered to do it for that reason. Mm. So I so I took a break and came back much more reflective. Like I should do things because I want to do them and then maybe share some of them if I think it's worth sharing rather than do things to share them. Yes. Um, so I think that's when you probably know there's a problem if, you, if you're doing things for the wrong reasons. So, but if you're, if you're doing things and, and it's making you feel well and you're feeling happy and positive, then maybe those six or seven hours are not a bad thing. That's good. That's good to hear because we hear so much about the negatives of it. It's nice to kind of turn it around. And I'll just I'll give it an example for, for myself that uh, I'm quite worried about is I, uh, as you know, I've got a newborn baby. So she's mm-hmm. 12 weeks old. Um, she started smiling about four or five weeks ago. So every time she smiles, I go and grab my phone and I want to record it, want to film it. But then I was thinking, well, one, I should just be enjoying the smile. And two, what she's seeing when she looks back, she's just looking at that, (laughs) my face. And I just wonder how much of, um, and this is going to sound a real cliche because it's talked about a lot, but we've lost the enjoying the moment because we're trying to capture Mm. the moment as opposed to enjoying the moment. Yeah, interesting. I, so I would say in your case, just my reflection on you with your beautiful newborn, keep taking those pictures because Mm. those pictures are part of your baby's story. And when your baby is older, those pictures are going to be a valuable artifact. And you're holding your photo presumably for like a few seconds when you take a picture that your baby doesn't even notice. But I agree with you that capturing the moment thing, like when I've been to concerts or events and I look around and everyone's just holding their phone up. And I purposely will, will not do that. I'll think, do you know what? Let's enjoy the moment. And I think that is a little bit sad because who wants to watch like a one hour video that you took of an event? Nobody, nobody wants to watch that. Take take a photo, take a selfie and then enjoy it. But it's yeah. hard, isn't it? And you've, I guess you've got a question, who's that video for? Again, if you're video, videoing, you know, your sweet baby doing something lovely, that video is a part of their story. That's a digital artifact that when they're older, that will bring them joy. Um, I lost my my dad when I was 21 and I didn't really have many photos of me and him like as a, when I was a teenager because you know when you're a teenager um, and I and I always wish I had more pictures so yeah. I definitely say do not feel any guilt about that that's very good but certainly why are you making a, a one-hour video of your concert like <laughs> who's gonna watch that well, yeah. please don't send that to me I'm not gonna watch it <laughs> Yeah, so what true. again what is what is the reason for the behavior I guess I guess that's what it comes down to why are you doing that are you doing that because you want to put it on social media and show off that you did that thing um what or, or is it because you you're so happy to be there that you want to go home and watch it and keep it mm. so again it's thinking what is our what is the reason behind our behavior because you know you know better than anyone um our behavior is always to meet a need so what is what is that need we are trying to meet with recording that thing or photographing that thing and sometimes yeah like for you and your baby definitely keep doing that (laughs) but maybe the people recording things stop doing that (laughs) yeah I I was just reflecting what you said earlier when you did come off social media for for a period did did you feel any better for doing it yeah definitely definitely I think at that time but we're talking about you know everything changes so quickly this was maybe what did I think seven years ago was again a totally different period in my life and that's another thing like as we as we change and we as humans change so quickly although our our core is the same I think we we change our behaviors change our likes change um 
So me then needed that break. Me now, like say three days in jail. No, I did not need that now because I'm in a different place like with my career and I want to have my network around me. Um, yeah. So I'm in a very different place. At that time, I was um, a young mum to a second child and I, it was just to the point, am I spending too much time on social media when I have other things that I need to be focusing my time on now? And we're only one person with so much energy um it's also thinking where do you need to distribute that energy and it got to the point I was thinking my energy is going in the wrong direction I need yeah. to refocus um and it actually felt really good and it was really hard um and I think when you know whenever we give up something we love it is hard but in the long time it was really good and I, and I went back like I say more reflective thinking so digital artifacts of my children again that's something now that I think that is really important for me to take photos of them and you know they hate it when we go somewhere I'm like stand in front of that tree but but I hope one day they will look back and go I remember when we did that and you know we'll all we'll all die who knows when but if I if I were to die tomorrow I'd love the thought that they would have these artifacts around which I felt I didn't have when my dad died um I had the last photo of me and him was from like a year before he died um and so yeah I always thought I wish I'd had more digital artifacts and so I guess that is maybe what drives me on to see the value of these digital artifacts in our society yeah I get that we're building a portfolio of our lives aren't we and yeah the, you know the first generation to sort of have Instagram to, to think that we could look back on 50 years of pictures it's incredible really really incredible and exciting it is and um, Poppy you already mentioned uh one project you're looking at to, to do with pornography um what else are you working on could you tell us anything else oh loads <laughs> Well, that's basically, um, we're, we're getting towards the end of the interview, and I always basically this is your opportunity to plug. Okay, so anything you want, oh, I'm to allowed really to plug. On, yeah, yeah, please do. Yeah, tell us your tell us your okay. Twitter handle, where they, people can find your work, what they can read cool, more cool, about, cool. about your stuff. Yeah. Okay, so I'll plug my two favorite things that I'm doing at the moment. Um, so anyone who's watching this, come join me on Twitter at um, Poppy Gibson UK and. You'll see what my pinned tweet is the Ukrainian lady that I took in um, last April. So when uh, the Russian invasion of Ukraine happened, I jumped on the government website, got visas for a mother and son to come live with me. Um, and they moved in and stayed with me all last year. And so my pinned tweet is me and Yulia, the Ukrainian mum, uh, 28 years old when she came over. And she and her son, Daniel, he was six at the time, came in and lived with me um, as my guests. And we wrote a Ukrainian book, which we launched in January, total nonprofit uh, for Voices of Children um, charity, which is a charity, really interesting charity. It's Ukraine based and they give psychological support to children who've witnessed war um, and been victims of war. So all the money from that book is going to charity. Um, off the back of that, really exciting, got picked up by PA Media and went out into um, ITV Independent. I got invited to um, by the Prime Minister to Downing Street a couple of weeks ago that was really cool to to think about how we can really make refugees uh welcome how we can support refugee migration how we can support refugee children in our schools and build that empathy and compassion so the most exciting thing i want to plug off the back of that and also to say thank you is um we're now just literally in about two weeks launching the teacher activity pack and i gave a shout out on social media so again this is why i love social media there you Connect go. There you go. <laughs> educators i never would have met um who've who've sent in resources for me like little lesson ideas they've come up with that that build empathy compassion understanding about refugee journeys um we've got a, an amazing forward coming in there from someone who's lived that journey um and this book is launching 18th of feb again all total non-profit so no money's being taken illustrated for free by artist terry colkin and written by um the book originally by me and yulia and the teacher resource pack by they have got 30 educators from all over the world I've got some of my students who I've encouraged to write some some activities as well because I don't think you know I hate people who think certain people should be gatekeepers of knowledge like let's encourage everyone to share if you've got an idea share it so really cool to see some of my students getting published in there in a couple of weeks um so if you want to search for it it's called a home for a Ukrainian um you'll find the ebooks currently available um and then this will be a print book coming out uh through Amazon in a couple of weeks and then the other really cool thing that you might be interested in actually um with your new baby but but not yet for this conversation but um I've currently got a book that I'm meeting my illustrator tomorrow actually Alfred uh, we're writing a book about death and how we have sensitive conversations with children about death 
um mm. because it's one thing that young children are fascinated by um but we don't always know how to talk about it with them and I, I've seen friends and family members who've said oh your cat's gone to sleep for a long time and I was like your cat died like your cat's not coming back <laughs> he had a good life but now his heart has stopped and we can bury him in the ground or the vet can put him in a fire and I think why not be blunt like otherwise you're setting children up for a real shock and surprise when slowly everyone around them will eventually die and they themselves will die um so that's really cool and really beautiful book so I'll have to, I'll keep you posted on when that's yeah, coming out too. yeah Fantastic. I think you know de death is such a big part of life I mean the, the biggest part the biggest other yeah. part of life is death but why do why in UK society again do we feel oh it's a bit of a taboo subject how is it taboo when every single one of us mm. is going to go through it? it's the one thing we all have in common despite everything else that we like or, or do we will all do this thing so yeah. yeah that should be pretty cool so yeah for anyone um you'll find me on LinkedIn Poppy Gibson if you're like a professional or find me on Twitter um Find me, I've just joined Instagram, so I'm still quite rubbish with that. So definitely yeah. everyone else is better. Like my friend told me the other day, like no one's posting pictures anymore, like make videos. And I was like, oh, I don't know if I'm ready for that, man. Like it must be getting old. <laughs> it's time to uh, knock out the TikToks and reels. You know, that's, that's oh, what I've no been way, talking. Matthew, no. I'm not, I'm not going there. <laughs> Too um, embarrassing. And, uh, your, your handle is just at Poppy Gibson UK. Just for, yeah, that's just right, that's right. As well. Fantastic. Well, thank you so much for your time today, Poppy. I really do appreciate it. And uh, yeah, thank, thanks and keep up the good work. And uh, hopefully we can chat further about some of your future research, if that's okay. Definitely, definitely. And just thanks for the opportunity to come on and, and talk with you and your listeners. Like a real no pleasure. You, I love like reflecting on what I do and it just makes you think I'm so, I just feel so blessed to be doing the stuff I'm doing. So thank you. <laughs> no worries. And you've got, I'm just looking, 28.4K twitter followers so you know they're, they're all show, my darlings they? they're <laughs> yeah, all amazing <laughs> they'll all be listening so shout out to every 28 uh k of you like you're great yeah. thanks for all the support <laughs> i love it thanks again poppy <laughs> thanks take, take care. care bye, bye now